Hello, BookTube. Hello, friends. Welcome to Lizzie Faye Loves Books. I'm Elizabeth, and it is time for my February wrap-up. So I thought I was going to be going to a book sale today. There's a small library that's in our area in a nearby county, and they usually have a small book sale during the first week of each month. And I had planned to go to that today, but I didn't see it listed on Book Sale Finder. So I called ahead, and they have changed the date. It's going to be a little later in the week. So I thought, well, since I don't need to go anywhere else that I can't put off till later, why not work on some videos today? I have a few in process that I am editing, but I have a few books from the library that really need to go back today. So I thought, why not go ahead and film my February wrap-up right now, even if it's still a few days before I actually have time to edit this one. That's okay. So let me just show you what I've been reading. So I had a fantastic reading month. I'm really excited about all that I got read. If you saw my 2020 goals video, you know that I am reading in lists. I have different categories of books and I'm trying to get through at least one from each of those lists every month. So I have 16 lists that I'm reading from. And in the month of January, I read from eight of those lists. So that's half. And then in February, I read from 10 of the lists. So I'm gradually creeping towards the goal of reading at least one from each list. I did read 15 books from the 10 lists that I read. And then I had a few other books that were uh, for other challenges. So I'm, I'm getting there. So I'm getting a little closer to my goal each month. Now, part of the reason is that I also threw in an extra readathon during the month of February, and there's going to be other months where I'm going to be doing the same type of thing. Like, of course, March is March Mystery Madness, so I'm reading extra mysteries for March. April, we'll do the week-long readathon called Amish in April, and so I'll throw in some extra Amish books. So there may not be very many months where I get through all 16 lists, there may not be any months where I get through all 16 lists, but that's okay. I finished a total of 26 books. Seven of them were Little House related, either by or about Laura Ingalls Wilder. And I had a few other books that do count towards my 20 by 20 challenge. They're just not on my high priority list, but they're still books that I want to read by the end of the year. So I'm glad that I got those done. So for my January wrap up, I grouped everything into categories. And I really liked how that translated into a video. It was just easier somehow to do them in groups. And I feel like maybe for you as a viewer, that can be better as well. Instead of going through what I read in the order that I read them, it just seems better organizational wise to put them together into categories. That way, if you're not interested in any one of these particular groups, then you could just fast forward past those. And like I did in January, I will put a list below of each category and where you can find it in the video. So you could just skip around and see the ones that you want to see. Also, I did manage to do a mid-month update or wrap up and I talked a good bit about several of the books that I had finished or that I was currently reading. So I'm going to try not to repeat myself too much and mainly focus on the books that I read during the second half of the month. But I will show you everything. In fact, I have a physical copy of every book I read except for the two Audible books. And for those books, I don't even know if a print copy exists. So I will edit in a picture of those and let's just get started. So of the books I finished, there were 26 of them for February, and 18 of them were audio and eight were print. Several of the print books were shorter, smaller books, like children's books. A lot of the shorter ones that were in print were for the Laura Ingalls Wilder or Little House Readathon. And so I'm gonna wait and show you those at the end because I've already showed those so much. I wanna get to the more recent stuff first. So just to kind of sum everything up, Here's a category that you don't often see on my channel. I read four westerns in February. Yeah, 
westerns. One of those was more of a mystery. It was like a crime fiction, but still it was a western, so I'm counting it. Then I read four books that are middle grade. One of those is kind of on the cusp between middle grade and YA, so we could just say four middle grade books. And I read three cozy mysteries, and then I read seven books that were Laura Ingalls Wilder related, either written by her or about her. And five of those I read during the Little House Readathon, and two of them I read after. And then I had the two books for the Audible Category Challenge, and then five others that I'm just going to lump together as other fiction. So let's get started. I think I will start with the Westerns, since that is the most unusual thing for me to read. Now, two of them are part of the Lonesome Dove series. In fact, I already talked about one of them in my January wrap-up, because I listen to this at the beginning of February and this is Dead Man's Walk by Larry McMurtry. Now there's two different ways you could read the Lonesome Dove series. Most people would agree to start with Lonesome Dove because that's the first book that was written. However, chronologically it's the third book. So I think because it really is the best one I think you should start with Lonesome Dove. Then after Lonesome Dove there is chronologically and publication wise comes Streets of Laredo. It's a big chunker and I listened to it in January. Then in order of publication, this one is next, Dead Man's Walk. This is the shortest by far of all of the books and chronologically this is the first book. I personally don't think you should start here. This is not the best book and if you start here you might not make yourself get to the best one which is Lonesome Dove. Someone else even recommended reading Lonesome Dove first then going back to the prequels and then finishing with Streets of Laredo because they liked Streets of Laredo and they wanted to end with something on a high note. You could do that, I suppose. I don't know. I just always generally think that publication order is best because you're reading things in the order that the author wrote them, so you're kind of following the mind of the author when you do that. That's just what I prefer. But anyway, Dead Man's Walk is the very earliest story about Gus and Call, and it's not a pretty book. There is definitely some graphic content, and if you don't mind that, then I would definitely recommend reading the whole series, especially Lonesome Dove. I mean, Lonesome Dove is just epic. And if you really like Lonesome Dove, then I would definitely continue on and read the rest of the series, which is what I have done. So I finished Dead Man's Walk at the beginning of the month, and then during Tome Topple, I listened to Comanche Moon, which is the second prequel. The events in Comanche Moon also take place before Lonesome Dove. Now, I kind of equated this to Episode 3 of the Star Wars movies because we already know what's going to happen next in Lonesome Dove and not everything is wonderful and happy and so in this book in order to make the story have any kind of continuity you kind of know if you've already read Lonesome Dove some of the sad things that have to happen in this book in order to get to the beginning of Lonesome Dove so you know, it's just like watching Anakin Skywalker turn into Darth Vader, except that it's not that actual thing. It's other stuff that's sad. But still, this book has to tie together everything. Anyway, I thought this was a really good book. I really thoroughly enjoyed the whole series. Now I've just got to twist my husband's arm and get him to read them all. I know that he will enjoy them and I may read them again one of these days. I bought them all on audio and I have all of them in print. I did loan out my copy of Lonesome Dove, which I may not get back, but if I'm ever at a fill a bag sale where I can run across another copy of Lonesome Dove, I'll probably grab it. And I just enjoy having these, and I really did thoroughly enjoy the series. One of the other westerns that I listened to at the beginning of the month is actually a mystery, and it's the first of the Longmire series by Craig Johnson. So I already talked about this in my mid-month wrap-up, and... I don't really want to say too much more than that, except that I really like the TV show better. But this wasn't bad, and I probably will read more from the series. And then I already talked about this a little bit too, although I had not quite finished it by the time I filmed my mid-month wrap-up. This was a book club book, and we like to read at least one book each year that's Florida-based, and this series is the Florida Cracker Westerns. I have, <laughs> I went to book club the next day after I filmed that mid-month wrap-up, and I have to tell you, I loved this book, and I got to book club, and no one else liked it. 
<laughs> Finally, someone came in late who did like it. And I was so glad she came in. I said, oh, thank you for coming in because I don't understand why no one else liked this book. The big thing now, kind of looking back, that they didn't like about it was the language. Now, this is written in kind of that country twang where you almost have to read it out loud or at least read it out loud in your head to get a full grasp of what's being said. You sort of have to translate it into modern English. And I think that's why a lot of the book club members didn't like it because they like to be able to read faster and they didn't want to have to slow down and read it. And even a few of them said that it just didn't grab their attention. I thought it was so fun and I really did enjoy it. Now maybe it's because I've read some of these Florida Cracker Westerns before. I kind of knew more what I was getting into. There is another book by this author that's about this character that I think was published earlier than this and I may have read it but it's one of the ones that we have on our shelves. It's called Riders of the Swanee. Both of these have a main character named Tate Barkley. And I, uh, I'm almost positive that I've read this one, but now I want to read it again because I don't remember anything about it. So this, I think, is a really fun series. Just know that it is written in that country language where you have to decipher it just a little bit. Now, not every book in the series is written by this author. And it's really just a collection. There's they don't need to be read in any certain order. There are a couple of different authors, so if you were to try one by Lee Grandling and you didn't care for it, but you still want to try again, there are a couple of other authors. I think John Wilson is one of them, and I can't remember who the other one is, but uh, I'll try to write that in the description below if you're interested. One of the cozy mysteries that I listened to in the month of February is Buried in a Bog by Sheila Connolly. This is the first in the County Cork series. It is set in Ireland. It's about an American woman. I believe she's from Boston, and she was raised by her grandmother. Her grandmother has recently died, and before her death, her grandmother told her that she really wanted her to go to Ireland. And so she doesn't have anything else to do, so she decides to go to Ireland. Well, when she gets there, all these things keep happening. People are found dead. There's like a many year old corpse that is unearthed in this bog, hence the title, and several other crazy things happen all in the span of a few days. And as you might guess, because this is the first in a series, she does decide to stay. So I'm interested to see how things will go in the next book. I didn't really love this book, and I think it could possibly be because of the narrator. The narrator made the main character seem really rude at times. Now, maybe that's the way the author wanted her to be perceived, but <laughs> there was one point near the end of the book that she said something, and then she said, sorry if that sounds rude, and I'm thinking, why are you sorry now? You have sounded rude through the whole book. But anyway, uh, I am interested to read more of the series. It would be interesting if I could go back in time and read it again for the first time, only this time in print, if I thought the same thing. There's no way to know that, but maybe by continuing on with the series, if I ever have time to actually just read one in print, I could see if she sounds any different. I don't know. If any of you have ever read this book and you read it in print, tell me your impressions. or. If any of you that hate audiobooks want to pick this up, just let me know what you think. Maybe it's just me, and maybe it's the narrator, and maybe she really is rude. I don't know. Anyway, so that's all I really want to say about this book. It was entertaining to an extent, and we are discussing this for my local mystery book club in the month of March, so I wanted to go ahead and get it read early. It is set in Ireland, so it would have been perfect for the Irish readathon, although I don't know that the author is Irish. I think she owns property in Ireland, so maybe that counts. I am going to probably go ahead and pick up the second book, which is called Scandal in Skybarine, and that will count for the Irish readathon so that I at least get in one Irish book during the month of March. I also listened to Espresso Shot by Cleo Coyle. This is part of the Coffee House Mystery Series. The best thing about this series is that it really makes me want to go and try some interesting flavors of coffee. And it makes me want to broaden my horizons a little bit because I mostly just drink black coffee. That's my jam and that's what I like. But this makes me really interested to try some different types of coffee. Uh, the series itself is not my favorite Cozy Mystery series, but I have collected a lot of them, and so I'm going to make an effort in March 
to listen to all the rest of these except maybe the last one because I don't know if I can get the last one on audio but there's 10 on audio that I can get on Hoopla and so that is my goal this is just a little bit steamier a little more urban um, it's not small town it's still considered a cozy mystery but it's definitely not your small town cozy it's set in New York City and that's probably about all I need to tell you at this point but if that interests you or if you've ever thought to try one out then I would definitely read the first one first because that really kind of sets up the dynamic and the family situation and, and everything like that I think this one is number seven in the series and I listened to the 26th book in Lillian Jackson Braun's Cat Who series the cat who talked turkey yes there are some turkeys in this book this was good it was very short and of course these last few books in the series are not quite as good as some of the books that are earlier in the series I have heard that Miss Braun herself did not write the very last few books of the series I don't know if they were written by a family member or if she just collaborated and somebody else did the majority of the writing I think she probably was uh, in failing health and ready to retire at the last you know when the last of these books were being written and you know I, I don't know the situation but I have heard that she did not write all of the the last few books so this was not bad I thought it was a little bit predictable I will say that the murder in this one I think was a little more prevalent than in a couple of the books prior to this but either way it doesn't matter I love Moose County I love the setting I love the characters and I thoroughly enjoyed it all right let me show you next the books that I have just labeled other fiction and a couple of these I've already talked about so I'll just briefly remind you I read from here to home by Marie Bostwick on my sister's recommendation and that finished that whole series for me everything related to Cobble Court and then for my newest book club I finally finished Every Breath by Nicholas Sparks this is only the third Nicholas Sparks book that I've read and I think I'm done with Nicholas Sparks unless somebody twists my arm really hard a long time ago I listened to The Guardian and then last year I listened to The Notebook and now this year Every Breath and I didn't love any of them I would say of the three I liked Guardian the best I enjoyed the movie The Notebook which I didn't watch until after the book and I'm glad I liked it because I've heard such good things about it and after listening to the book I thought oh man am I even gonna like the movie and I did I liked the movie I thought it was very well done but uh, this book I just didn't buy the romance and I wasn't sympathetic to the plight of the characters really especially the female so I don't know it, it just wasn't a favorite uh, by any means and then here's another one that wasn't a favorite either someone who's read this please explain this to me <laughs> I read this on the recommendation of one of my book club members from the same book club where we read this book and she had been telling me about this I guess she read it fairly recently and she loved it and she said oh you must read it because we have had several books in common that we've both enjoyed so she loaned me this copy and I found it on audio at the library and I listened to it in the last few days of the month and I might would have been able to follow it a little better had I read it in print but honestly I don't think I'm interested enough in it to ever go back and read it in print it was kind of a fantasy but maybe the fantasy parts were meant to just be analogies I don't know I was really confused by the book the parts that were most interesting there was a whole storyline about a deathless man so that was kind of the fantasy part and then there was a couple of different storylines about a tiger and that was interesting but the story kept jumping back and forth and I had a hard time just following it because a lot of times when it would go back and tell a story from the past it wouldn't be in the same time frame there was several different time frames that it would jump back to it was tricky to to figure out when what was being told was actually happening does that make sense so I don't know I was really confused <laughs> by the book in general and I don't really know what I was supposed to get out of it maybe it was just supposed to be this lyrical literary work 
I don't know, but it wasn't really my type of book. If you've read it, let me know your thoughts. I may have just missed the point completely, and I'm not saying that you wouldn't enjoy it because my friend really liked it. I'm just saying it really wasn't for me. It was about a woman who uh, was a doctor, and her grandfather had been a doctor. And at some point in the book, he dies, and when his body gets returned to their home, his things are not with him. So she goes in search of his things, and throughout the whole book, we go back and forth with her reminiscences of her grandfather and his reminiscences and his stories that he told her when she was younger. So you can kind of see why it can get confusing. It says it takes place in a Balkan country. It mentions a lot of Turkish things. And I don't really know my geography over there. But Berna from Berna's Bookish Adventures. She lives in Turkey. Maybe Berna, this is something that you would enjoy. You might know some of the setting where this takes place. I don't know. Anyway, uh, it really wasn't a book for me. But I did read it on the recommendation of my friend. And I'm glad that I can now tell her that I read it. One of the grittier books that I listened to during the month of February was The Face Changers by Thomas Perry. This is book four in the Jane Whitefield series. Without going into too much about this book, Jane is a half Native American woman. I believe Seneca is her tribe. And she helps people disappear. Now, they don't necessarily have to be criminals. In fact, I think she prefers that they not be criminals. But she doesn't ask a lot of questions, sometimes to her detriment. But she helps people disappear who are in trouble, who need help, and have no one else to turn to. Now, you might guess that for her type of service, she can't really advertise. And people find her through word of mouth. And since the third book, she has gotten married and had agreed with her husband that she would not do this work anymore. He was worried about her. But at the beginning of this book, her husband comes to her and asks her to help his colleague. So her husband is the one who pulls her back in to this work, even though he was the one who didn't want her to do it in the first place. And because it's one of her husband's colleagues and he's a doctor, he is now a suspect in everything that's happening. So this was a really interesting book. The dynamic of it is very interesting. Also in this book, someone is impersonating her, but for the wrong reasons. Now Jane helps people because she wants to. Someone else has decided that they could impersonate her and they could do a bit of extortion while they're doing this. So that brings in a new element to things as well. So this was really good. I have enjoyed the series. And because this is book four, I'll be able to read book five for March Mystery Madness, which fits in with the theme of five for this year. And then two books that are from the same series. A lot of people consider these fantasy. I consider them prophecy to an extent, to as much of an extent as we can really know. And these are from the Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins. Earlier in the month, I listened to The Remnant. And then the very last book of February that I listened to on audio is Armageddon. And these were okay. I keep being pulled out of the story because of the pronunciations by the narrator. I don't want to go into all that right now, but that makes me frustrated. For some reason, these books didn't really grab me and shake me like books like The Mark, which is where they first started beheading people. So I don't know, you know, now we're kind of just marking time to get to the final glorious appearing and, you know, when Christ comes back. So you know, we just know that in these last three years of the tribulation, a lot of bad stuff is going to happen, and that's what's happening in these books. So there's some sadness, there's some tragedy, there's a lot of violence, and that's pretty much what's in these books. So if you have started the series and you're interested in finishing, then you got to keep working your way through these. They are on audio on Hoopla, and thankfully for that, because I don't think I could sit down and read these in print. I'm really glad that they're on audio, even though I don't like how the narrator pronounces everything. I, that really pulls me out of the story. But anyway, I'm still glad they're on audio because that helps me get through them a lot quicker. So then I also had two books that I listened to on Audible because I'm doing the Audible Escape Challenge. And so I'm trying to listen to at least one book on the Audible Escape package from each of the 41 categories. The two categories that I drew out for the month of February were Immortals 
and time travel. So both a little bit supernatural. I did find a Christian romance for time travel. So some of you might think that's a little bit contrary, but it was really cute. It was by Teresa Ives Lilly. I did listen to a St. Patrick's themed book by her not too long ago, maybe last year, and I thought it was cute. So she writes some just short stories that are Christian romances. This one was really cute. It was historical. It was about a young servant girl in a manor house, and she comes to work at this house, and she learns that the grandson of the matriarch of the house has gone missing. After he went up in the attic, he was sent for Christmas decorations, and he never came back down, and no one knows what's happened to him. So she is now sent up to the attic to get the Christmas decorations and while she's going through things she finds this snow globe and so when she picks up the globe and turns it over she is transported into the snow globe village that's inside the snow globe and of course you know you can probably guess she finds the grandson there and he doesn't want to go back he loves living in the snow globe village he was not happy being in, from an aristocratic family he likes the simplicity of the snow globe village and it was just a really sweet story i really enjoyed it the one thing because it's a short story and the world wasn't really fleshed out i didn't know if they were limited to just that village like if they felt like they were actually living in a snow globe or if that was just a gateway into another world. It never really specified, but I thought it was a really cute story and I did thoroughly enjoy it. Now the other one was Immortals, and so for this challenge I found a Santa Claus book because we all know Santa Claus is immortal, right? This book was called The Christmas Makeover by Caroline Mickelson. Now she has a few magical romances that are on the Audible Escape package. I've listened to a couple of them before. This one had a couple of issues that I wasn't crazy about. For one thing, I think the personality of Santa that she portrayed is not completely accurate. The main female character in the book was an interior decorator. I think she was somehow related to Santa. So Santa calls her to come and redecorate the house where him and Mrs. Claus are living. And he also hires an architect to come as well. Well, this architect has never met the interior decorator. Although they're both friends of the Claus family, they have never actually met together. They've never been at the North Pole at the same time. And Santa and Mrs. Claus would like to get them together. So they call them both there. Santa wants them to do this project, but he wants it to be a surprise to Mrs. Claus. So rather than give her some kind of story that's true, he lies and says that these two people are engaged. So there you go. You have Santa lying, not telling the truth to Mrs. Claus. So then in order to get Mrs. Claus out of the house so they can redecorate, he, he tells Mrs. Claus that he's going to give up their living space for these two lovebirds so that they can have that space and then him and Mrs. Claus are going to go stay somewhere else. So Santa is going to have these two unmarried people living in their house. Now they're not really engaged and they're, they don't even know each other. But he, the idea that he's going to have these two people who are supposedly engaged staying in their house unmarried. So that's my two issues. <laughs> that and the fact that he's lying I think puts Santa on his own naughty list. So the personality that's portrayed of Santa I think is wrong in this story. The story itself is kind of cute but those were the problems I had with it so it kind of made me not like the story overall. But anyway you can think what you will but that's that was my impressions of the of the book. So it turns out that both of the books I listened to in February were both Christmas themed books. The Snow Globe book was also at Christmas time and uh, it I really liked but the other one not so much. I did listen to two other Caroline Mickelson books last year that I thought were really cute and I did enjoy those much more than than this one. It was called The Christmas Makeover. Alright so the middle grade books that I read 
One of the middle grade books that I read in the month of February is Playing Atari with Saddam Hussein by Jennifer Roy and Ali Fadil. This is the true story of Ali's childhood growing up in Iraq. This book is set in early 1991 during the war when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. I don't remember the name that we called it here in the U.S., but of course the U.S was a part of that war. I was already a young adult at that point. I was in my 20s. I was working in a fairly new career and I honestly wasn't paying a lot of attention to world events, sad to say, and if you think that's horrible, then you're right. I should have been paying more attention, but it was really good to read about this event from the eyes of someone who experienced it. Now, I believe he was 12, somewhere it was either 12 or 13 or 14, when this takes place. I thought it was a really good perspective to look from. It had a lot of heartfelt moments and just a lot of feelings going on while this was taking place. Thankfully, no huge tragedies happened to him or his family. His father was a dentist, so he is called to work towards the war effort. So for a good part of this book, his father is out of the picture and they don't know when and if he'll ever return. And there is an epilogue 14 years later and we get to find out what Ali is doing 14 years after this and it's pretty amazing. And this is all based on a true story. Now we do learn at the end in the notes how Jennifer Roy, the author, came to meet Ali and write his story. This is one of the Sunshine State books for this school year and I have put it off till almost the end because I think I was a little bit nervous to read it, but I needn't have been. It was really a good book. It's very short. It did not take very long to read and I just thought it was very heartfelt, very good, and perfectly safe for young eyes to read it. They do get a glimpse of what it is like to live in a war-torn country, but without too much gore. There is some, there is some really startling moments. It does take place in a war, so you do get a glimpse of some really hard things in this book, but you see them through a child's eyes, and I think it is a very well done book, and definitely one that I think would be great for kids to read, especially if they want to learn a little bit about the history of that time period. And if they want to read a book based on a true story, maybe for some sort of a book report or something, this is a really good book for that. So I enjoyed it. I'm glad that I finally read it. it it's something that I probably never would have picked up if it hadn't been on the Sunshine State book list for middle schoolers. And I'm just really glad that I read it. I already talked about Amos Fortune Free Man. This was my Newberry winner for the month. And then I also did accomplish reading one of the series of unfortunate events. This is number three, The Wide Window. And then this one could probably be considered YA or middle grade. It's certainly fine for either. This is book five in the Kingdom Keeper series by Ridley Pearson. I hate to admit that I've really lost interest in the series. And despite my connection to Disney, I'm just having a hard time with this series now. This book and the next one take place on the Disney Cruise Line, and I've only ever been on The Magic, and that was back in 1999, so I don't remember a whole lot about it. I have worked on a cruise ship before, and so I do know a little bit about what they're talking about when they're talking about cruise ships, but still... I don't know, this book was so long and I just really started losing interest in it. I do want to get through the series though, and so before the month was over, I started Dark Passage, which is book number six, and at the end of the day on February 29th, I still had quite a bit of this left to go. I sped it up to three times speed and I turned it on and then I fell asleep. So I woke up the next day and I thought, I cannot count this for February. So this was the first book I finished in March. I did go back and listen to all of that three times speed stuff again at like 1.5 or 1.8 because the narrator is McLeod Andrews and he does not speak very slowly. In real time, he speaks kind of fast. So I'm not able to speed this one up as much as some audiobooks. So this one I think kept my attention a little bit better than the previous one. Maybe it's because it's not as big. The next one and final one of this series is also a chunker. So I don't know. 
I'm going to go ahead and get through it. And maybe it would hold my attention better if I was just reading them in print. I do own the whole set, so if I ever have time in my life, I'll go back maybe and try to read them in print. And I think I would probably enjoy them a lot better. The other thing, too, is that they're starting to get a little bit dated, especially the earlier books, like the first four books that take place in the parks. They make mention of a lot of things that aren't there anymore. And, you know, that's the nature of Disney because Disney is ever-changing attractions come and go there are a few things that have stayed steady over the years but certain attractions come and go and what's popular with Disney today is going to be different than what was popular 10 years ago or 10 years in the future so it's kind of tricky I think to to write something like this but it's still entertaining I just am having a hard time getting really in the mood for it and I put them on my 20 by 20 list because it's a series sitting on my shelves that I really want to get through and there's a spin-off series there's a kind of a segue book called syndrome and then there's a spin-off series called the return and I've got some of those too I'm gonna keep working my way through them but I, I hope that as I continue they'll start to grab my attention a little bit better Okay, the last thing I have to show you are the books that I read for the Little House Readathon. And I did read one book later in the month that counts as a Little House book. And I read this to my daughter, Emily. It's called My Little House ABCs. This was a really good book. It is an ABC book, and it talks about things that are mentioned in the first three books that are about Laura. So that would be Little House in the Big Woods, Little House on the Prairie, and On the Banks of Plum Creek. And it gives you the alphabet, it gives you what the letter is for, and then down here in the bottom, there's a sentence or two about that item and what book it came from. So I did really enjoy it. I read this to Emily, and she continued to look through it over and over and over. So she enjoyed looking at it. I may try to see if our library has the Little House 123s and see if she would enjoy looking at that one as well. Then right after the readathon, I read Prairie Girl, The Life of Lauren Wilder by William Anderson. And then during the readathon, I read the one that's for a little younger audience by William Anderson called Pioneer Girl, The Story of Laura Ingalls Wilder. I also read Laura Ingalls Wilder's Fairy Poems. And then I read, I read an old version of the Little House Guidebook. And on audio, I listened to Caroline, Little House Revisited by Sarah Miller. I did a review of that on my channel. And on audio cassette, I listened to Farmer Boy by Laura Ingalls Wilder. I had read that in my childhood, and I had listened to it again in adulthood, but it was sitting around, and I thought, you know, I've got time. I may as well listen to this again. And the one I did not get to that I started was Little House on Rocky Ridge. This is the first of the Rose Years by Roger Lee McBride. I only got one chapter read. I kept it sitting around all during the month, and I just never picked it back up. So I'm going to put this on the back burner probably until middle grade May and try to pick it back up then. I did go ahead and take it off my currently reading list. At whatever point I actually pick it back up again, I'll just start it over because I only read one chapter. So I started this one barely, but I didn't get anywhere in it. And there were a couple of other Laura-related books that I didn't even start. So that was my reading month. I did also have two other Christian books that I'm continuing to read. One is called A Year with C.S. Lewis that I'm reading throughout the year and has a page a day. And then I also have a nonfiction Mary and Martha book that I have gotten to about the halfway point in and I'm just going to keep on reading that a few pages each morning with my daily devotional and hope to finish that by the end of March. And in my Bible reading, I also finished the book of Ezekiel and the book of Daniel. Daniel is very short, so I finished Ezekiel about halfway through the month and then read the whole book of Daniel during the month of February. So the next five books of the Bible are also very short. I added up the chapters and it looks like I'm going to be able to read exactly five books of the Bible during the month of March too. So I'm just going to continue to perpetuate that five theme <laughs> during March. And then my goal is to finish reading all the way through the end of the New Testament by the end of the year in my three-year 
time frame of reading the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So that's all I read for the month of February. What did you read for the month of February? I would love to hear about it. I have not had a chance really to watch very many February wrap-ups because I've been getting everything underway for March Mystery Madness, but I hope I will be able to go back and watch some of those. But for now, I've got to get some of these back to the library, and that's all I have for this video. I hope you're having a great day. Read a good book, and God bless you.